Geometry Common Core, the June 2016 Regents exam. This is the first video in a series of videos where I, I'm going to go through the entire June 2016 Regents exam. I'm going to try to keep the videos to about 10-12 minutes each, get as far as I can each video, and uh, we'll see how many videos it takes to complete the exam. You know, a good tactic I, I do recommend uh, if, if you're watching these for the first time, uh, especially for this particular playlist, is to, you know, um, you know, in the title of this video, I should say which questions I cover in this video. I, I suggest that you try to do those questions yourself first without watching the video. You know, put the answers on a separate piece of paper and, and do those questions and then watch the video and take down the notes and, and see if you got the questions correct. And if, if you got them wrong, then, you know, I think that will really help you learn why you got it wrong and, um, you know, be a, a great benefit to you. So let's dive in. Number one, a student has a rectangular postcard that he folds in half lengthwise. Next, he rotates it continuously about the folded edge. Which three-dimensional object below is generated by this rotation? Uh, so this is difficult for me to sketch because I'm on a two-dimensional surface. But if we have a rectangular postcard and fold it in half, it's still basically a rectangle. And if I take that, let's say I folded it on this edge, and if I continuously rotate, you know, I'm not just reflecting it over there, otherwise it would just be another rectangle. Some people think it's a rectangle, they see 3D, so they want to jump at rectangular prism. But when you rotate somebody, or somebody, when you rotate something uh, along an axis and spin it around, you know, the, the, te the term around there has the word round, it creates a circular motion when you spin something around an axis. That's why you're going to create a cylinder here. It's the cross-section of a rectangle spun around. Number three. Number three. Uh, this is a, a good start. Uh, number two, a three-inch line segment is dilated by a scale factor of six. Uh, and it's centered at its midpoint. Uh, you know, anytime you have a scale factor, you want to think multiplication. So if it's three inches and it's being dilated by a scale factor of six, the answer is going to be 18. It's simply six times three. But... And that, that is the answer. I, I think what scares people about the question sometimes is the centered at the midpoint. But you could kind of draw the sketch that if you had a, you know, let's say this is uh, a three-inch line segment. And from its midpoint, it's dilated by a scale factor of six. So that means you have one and a half on both sides. And if you do that amount times six, so times six out, that new length, if you look at 1.5, times 6, you end up with 9. And it's going to be that in both directions. So it still does end up being, oh, sorry, that's 9, but the whole thing ends up being 18. Uh, so really, when you see scale factors, you want to think multiplication. Kevin's work for deriving the equation of a circle is shown below. Uh, so let's see what he's doing here. He's got this. Uh, so the first thing it looks like he did is he distributed the negative sign there. And then he's completing the square, the process of completing the square. He took the B term, divided it by 2, and squared it. That's where this plus 4 comes. Here's an issue. Because when you complete the square, you the number you add, you add it to both sides. You don't minus it to both sides. This should be a plus 4. So step 2, there's a mistake. And then he factors it correctly into you know parentheses squared. And this side he did nothing with. Um, and then he brought the Y squared over and combined like terms there. So there are no mistakes here. But which step did it make an error in? As we saw, that happened in step two. We should be adding four on both sides, not adding four on one side, subtracting four on the other. Which transformation of OA would result in an image parallel to OA? Well, here's OA. If we translate it two units down, it's you know moving this you know kind of two units down. Is it parallel? Yes, it is. I believe that to be the answer. But I always want to, when I have a true-false question like this, I want to check every choice. All right, well, how about if I reflect it over the x-axis? Uh, that would, let's see, I could flip this upside down. Reflected over the x-axis would look something like that. Are they parallel? Absolutely not. And how about if I reflect it over the y-axis? Reflect it over the y-axis, it'll look like that. Are they parallel? No. Uh, what if I rotate it 90 degrees about the origin clockwise? 
Uh, so we're talking about clockwise. That's in this direction, rotating 90 degrees, meaning they're going to be perpendicular. So right away, they're not going to be parallel. So that is also false. So one it is. If you check all four choices and end up with three false and one true, or three trues and one false, then you're probably in good shape. But if you end up with two trues or just two falses, you need to take a second look, read the question again, check your math, that type of stuff. So it's a great way to check your work, make sure you're doing things properly. Using the information given below, which set of triangles can not, you know, I stress this so much to my classes and so many students still need the reminder, circle keywords. Underline or circle, especially things like not or what to round to or isosceles or parallel, like, you know, this class question, I underlined parallel, I'm going to circle it, it's even better. So what is not uh, similar? A similarity is different than congruency. Remember, for congruency, we had side, 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 angle, side, angle, side, angle, um, angle, angle, side, and hypotenuse legs. There are five different ways to do congruency. But similarity, there's just angle, angle, side, angle, side, and side, side, side. There's only three models for proving similarity. And remember, for Congruency, when you see side, angle, side, that means two sides congruent, angle between them congruent. But side, angle, side similarity is two pairs of sides proportionate angle between congruent. So the S's here stand for proportionate. The A's stand for congruent when we're talking about similarity. Um, but if something is congruent, then it is similar. So we look at the choices here, you know, choice A. Again, this is kind of a true-false, and you see a lot of that um, lately in these exams, especially in geometry. So I want to check all four of these. So right away, I see that it's set up to be side-angle-side. Now, it's definitely not side-angle-side congruency because the numbers aren't the same, but is it similarity? I can't just trust it. I have to test the proportion. So let's see, like the 12 over 9 from this triangle, is that proportionate to the 4 over 3 of the other triangle? Let's see, if I cross multiply this, 9 times 4 is 36, 12 times 3 is 36. Yes, that is proportionate. The angle between them is congruent. So this is side, angle, side. So we're looking for a not one. So this is a true, but we're looking for a false. I'll go down to B. B shows us two pairs of angles congruent. So right away, that's angle, angle. So yeah, that's similar. How about C? I have two sides and an angle. But for similarity, two sides, and for congruency, if you have two sides and one angle, the angle must be between the sides. And that would be this angle here. If we're talking about this side and this side, you know, the angle where the two sides meet, that has to be the angle in question. And that's not the case here. So this would be like that side side angle donkey theorem type of situation. So I believe that to be false, but let me check the last one. Last one says, um, Two pairs of sides congruent, angle between congruent. So this is a form of side angle side congruencies. And if things are exact copies, then they're definitely similar. So that is true. So I got three trues, one false, and I'm looking for false. Choice C is definitely the correct answer. Next up, uh, for some reason the problems here aren't showing me the numbers. Let me, let me just check that to see where we're at. Uh, just give me one second, sorry, I should probably pause the video while I do this, but um, I have a hard copy of the exam right here, so I just wanna check to see where we are. Uh, this is number six, so we're on number six here. A uh, company is creating an object from a wooden cube uh, with an edge length of 8.5. A right circular cone with a diameter of eight, that's super important. They love giving you diameter because you always need radius. And an altitude of eight will be cut from it. Which expression will represent the remaining volume? So you're starting with the wooden cube. Now uh, on your reference sheet, which you're provide, uh, given, you know, the day of the test, the state reference sheet, same one for all the regions exams you have in math, same one you had last year in algebra one. It does give you volume formulas. Um, it tells you a general prism is just area of base times height. A cube 
is you know the area of that square base times its height. And so it works out just to kind of be the volume is your side cubed because it's side times side for the area of the base times the height, which is also the side. The cube, all three dimensions are equal. So the volume is side cubed. So if we have an edge length of 8.5, the volume of that cube is going to be 8.5 times 8.5 times 8.5, 8.5 cubed, which is what they all have. So then it's we minus a cone's volume. And again, your um, the volume of a cone formula, which is given to you, is one third pi r squared h. So if we don't have a one third, that rules out choices a and b. So here's one third pi r squared h. So really, the only difference here is in the r squared. That's why I started this. I you know I knew it was going to become very relevant. If the diameter is eight. That means the radius is 4. So it's 4 squared, 8, choice D. Uh, number 7, and maybe I'll make this the, uh, the last one of this first video. Um, two right triangles must be congruent if what? An acute angle in each triangle is congruent. Well, think about it. If we, we have right triangles. If they're right triangles, all we know is that we have an angle congruence because they both have a 90 degree angle. If I get one more acute angle, that's angle, angle. I'm looking for congruency, which again, that's not going to be enough. That would prove similarity. So I'm going to say false. The lengths of the hypotenuses are equal. Well, then I'd have a side and an angle, but that's still not quite enough for congruency, so I'm going to say false, right? I need side, angle, side, or, or um, angle, angle, side. Uh, the corresponding legs are congruent. Well, remember that for a right triangle, we already know the right, ang right angle is congruent. The legs are on both sides of the right angle. So I believe that is a form of side angle side, which is going to work. And then we just check the last choice. The areas are equal. Well, just because they're the same, you know, take up the same amount of space does not mean necessarily they are the, uh, the same triangle. I mean, area of a triangle is one half base times height, you could have, you know, like uh, 10 and 2, the area of that's going to be 10, but we could also have a right triangle that's um, 4 and 5, the area of that's also going to be 10, and they're not congruent, so that is false. So that's the last one. So this is, again, kind of thinking about that side angle side, you know, type of stuff for uh, congruency. All right, just passed up 12 minutes. We'll pick up on number 8 in the next video. See ya.